Hi everyone, my name is Kees Keizer. I'm an assistant professor and consultant in the field of influence and persuasion. And today we are gonna discuss social norms. Social norms are rooted in the work on conformity. They're based on it. If you have no idea what I mean with conformity, please watch the video prior to this one in which I well, explain that. And it also gives you a nice set of background history in how we ended up with social norms. So please watch that one. What are social norms? Social norms are what guides behavior, steers behavior in society. The approved and disapproved and commonly observed behavior in every setting. They're often seen as quite powerful when it comes to influencing our behavior. However, when we looked at the research that was being done on social norms, they sometimes were seen as having a tremendous impact on behavior, but not always. Sometimes the, the results of these experiments were quite conflicting. That was a starting point for, for example, Cialdini and his colleagues to dive into the topic and see what's going on there. Why are they sometimes so predictive and sometimes they are not? He says that then the first thing you need to do is distinguish between two types of social norm. So the first one, injunctive social norms. They are the approved or disapproved behavior by others in a specific setting. And injunctive norms are everywhere. They tell us how to act, what we should do, what we shouldn't do in a uh, setting. We should be silent in a library, that we should not speed at the motorway, that we close maybe to wear at a specific occasion. These are all injunctive norms. The first thing you probably understand is that there can be differences between culture. If you would go to the UK, then you may have noticed that people are really good there at queuing, standing in line and it's completely clear when it's your turn maybe to order something. However, in the Netherlands, we like to th spice things up a bit. So we scatter all over the place. There is no queue whatsoever. However, do not be mistaken because the Dutch are very keen at and nobody going prior to his turn. If you do so, be alarmed because the Dutch can be very violent when it comes to uh, uh, cutting in line. I, I think torturing somebody's pet that would get them more excited. So first point is they can differ from culture to culture. However, they can also differ from setting to setting. If you go to a library what is the social norm there? Did you ever visit the library? I hope you did. If you go there, what, what is the social norm? Normally it is that you are quiet. It is not a social norm in a bar or a nightclub. It would be okay, of course, if you wanna read up on your Shakespeare while being at the club. However, uh, you probably frowned upon and, and people look, that is weird. Completely different social norm not being silent but being outspoken and talking to people is the norm in the club but in the library it's something different so they're situation dependent important fact of social norms another example now this is the male arrest room uh, if you haven't ever visited this is what it looks like and typically we have three of these urinals so which one do you pick when you have to go if somebody's already standing there on the far left side, it is a social norm, but not one we talk about to take the one on the opposite side. You want to maximize your distance of other people. We don't talk about it, but that is the social norm. P.S. If you weren't aware of this social norm, this one you should remember. Our second type of social norm, the descriptive social norm. And the descriptive social norm is what I perceive to be the commonly shown behavior in a specific setting. What others typically do in a specific setting. 
the behavior observed. Now, this would be if you uh, go online and you, you watch for the most bought product. So what do people typically buy when they wanna buy a digital camera? There will be a, a descriptive social norm. But it's also when you enter somewhere and let's make it a lecture hall and uh, you step inside and you see everybody sitting at the back please don't do that also come at the front otherwise i'm always lonely there but this is what you typically see it is the behavior that the majority of people or many others are showing in a specific setting the descriptive social norm is not influencing behavior via rewards, social rewards and social punishment or sanctions, but it's doing so by letting you know what is probably the most adaptive behavior in a given setting. If you are at a railroad station or an airport, you have no idea where, where to go to, you probably watch what the majority of people are doing. What the majority is doing is often the correct or most adaptive behavior in a given setting. Think back to the um, experiments of Sharif and Ash that we watched before. One of the experiments that Cialdini did to show and reveal the impact of the descriptive norm on behavior was a experiment including litter. Now, litter that is lying on the ground is uh, more than a nuisance alone. It is also an indication of behavior of other people. Namely, that many people in that context littered. So what he did was he looked at the dependent variable of whether people would litter a flyer that they received. Would they throw it on the ground or would they just take it with them? And uh, what he varied was the state of that specific setting, namely whether it was clean or pre-littered. And what he showed was that in a clean environment, 14% of the people um, tend to litter that flyer that they just received, which still is a lot, but okay. And uh, however, when that uh, setting is pre-littered and there's a lot of litter already laying around, then that raises to 32% which shows, well, it, it might feel like an open door, yeah, 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 sure, but what it shows is that we tend to align our behavior to the behavior of other people in that setting, which in this case is littering. Now, it also shows something important bringing us back to the story about injunctive and descriptive norms. It shows that the injunctive and descriptive norm can conflict. In many cases they will align and people generally do what is commonly approved or disapproved, but in a pre-littered setting the injunctive norm is saying you should not litter, it is disapproved. However, the descriptive norm is clearly showing you that many people do litter. Hence why Cialdini says it is important to make a distinction between the two. Now, the other reason why it's important to distinguish between the two is because, as I mentioned, that there is a different process behind the two. One is doing it via social rewards and social sanctions, namely the injunctive norm, and the other one is influencing behavior by showing you what is probably the most adaptive, the wisest behavior in a given setting. That is the descriptive norm. Now, I hear you think, well, not really because I don't have these powers. If injunctive and descriptive can be both present in a given situation and they are in conflict, what then determines behavior? What influences how you would behave in that specific setting? Cialdini and colleagues had an answer for this. They said it is all up to salience the extent to which that type of social norm is in your attention span, on top of mind, and salient. The type of norm that is most salient will govern your behavior in that setting. This whole story about the distinction between injunctive and descriptive and how they influence uh, via which process 
they regulate your behavior and the role of salience these together make what they call the theory of normative conduct and there is a whole creative and nice line of research surrounding it diving into the role of salience for example which we're gonna look now so the role of salience um remember i just mentioned that um people are more likely to litter a flyer in a pre-littered environment namely in a clean environment people uh, 40 percent of the people littered the received flyer versus this was 32% uh, in a pre-littered uh, setting. Now, we can even increase this difference between the two conditions if we make the descriptive norm, basically what other people did in that setting, uh, more salient. Cialdini did this in an experiment by having a confederate, so somebody who was in uh, with research on the experiment, walk in that specific setting and throw a piece of litter on the ground and was being observed by oh, by the participants. Now, participants who observed this confederate litter in a littered setting were even more inclined to also litter. 32% that we saw was increased to 54% of the people also littered pre-littered setting with the confederate littering. If this confederate, however, littered in front of the eyes of the participant in a clean environment, this did not result in a increase in littering, but a decrease in littering. So less people were inclined to also litter. Now that's interesting it is interesting for a number of ways first of all try to think of that scene so you see somebody throwing a piece of litter on the ground in a clean environment why are you after that less likely to litter Cialdini's argument is that the action of the confederate focuses attention on the fact that nobody else in that environment had littered. It makes that descriptive norm of not littering very salient and that's driving the effect. Um, defining is also very very nice for a different reason. It shows that descriptive norm influence are actually different than modeling. Modeling is when you copy the behavior of one specific person. So you watch, the, observe the behavior of one person and you're doing the exact same thing. This shows that there is something different going on. The one littering confederate didn't have an increasing effect. It had a decreasing effect. So it, for Cialdini and colleagues, it showed that there is a different process going on than with modeling. The experiment greatly shows the role of salience. So they did various experiments um, focusing on this salience effect and did conceptual replications. So tried it in various ways just to be more confident about the salience effect. But it also work if you use one piece of very conspicuous litter which basically is sending the same signal, right? One person threw something on the ground and the others did not. And he showed that it had exactly the same effect. I think the one piece of litter was a big watermelon that was splashed on the ground in an otherwise clean environment. After observing that, people were less inclined to throw stuff on the ground than they did in a otherwise clean environment. In a different experiment, Cialdini looked with colleagues looked at the relationship between the pieces of litter laying on the ground, so the number, and uh, the likelihood of people littering in that environment. Now, uh, compared to a clean environment, if there's one piece of litter laying there, you see that 18% of the people tend to throw a flyer they just received on the ground. And this drops in line with what we just saw, 
to 10% uh, when there is just one piece of litter laying in the ground. And after that, if the number increases, so then uh, also the likelihood that people will throw stuff on the ground. So it raises to 20% if there are two pieces on the ground and uh, to uh, 23 if there are four pieces on the ground and so forth. This is all about the uh, salience in descriptive norms. So making the descriptive norm more salient makes it more influential. Does the same hold true as the theory of normative conduct suggests also for injunctive norms? Yes, it does. They did a line of experiments on that as well. And one of them is a very nice bridge. Um, it started out as an experiment on descriptive norms. It took place on a very windy day. And on that windy day, they first had a clean setting. And after that, they had this pre-littered setting. People were less inclined to litter in a fully littered environment. What is going on? The research thought. In that specific situation, the wind, and this is the explanation they gave, the wind all uh, blew it into a pile and it had the whole impression that somebody was uh, being active with a broom and had actually sweeped all the litter into one big pile and thereby making not the descriptive norm top of my mind, focusing attention actually on the injunctive norm, that it is disapproved to litter. They also did it with using a confederate, and rather than in the previous experiments using a confederate, where the confederate walked by or threw something on the ground, thereby focusing attention on the descriptive norm, they now had a confederate picking up something. So um, they did the experiment in a pre-littered environment, a lot of litter laying around, and um, they were observed whether people um, threw again a received flyer on the ground, yes or no, in this specific context, which took place in a parking garage, 38% uh, of the people littered the received flyer in that pre-littered. However, when the participants um, had observed a confederate walking by in this pre-littered environment and picking something up from the ground, uh, from the ground clearly disapproving of this littering behavior of others. Uh, that greatly reduced whether people, the participants, littered, yes or no. It um, reduced it from the 38% we just saw to actually 4%. So, Seeing and observing somebody making salient the injunctive norm, the disapproval for littering, also strengthens the impact of the injunctive norm. This all explains the power of salience in both injunctive and descriptive norms. In sum, uh, Cialdini and his colleagues did a whole line of very creative behavioral research in uh, mostly field settings. And they shed a lot of light on the discussion on social norms with their theory of normative conduct, with its main points are that you should make a distinction between injunctive and descriptive social norms because they have a different process, why they influence behavior, but also because they can be in conflict, well, and align uh, in a given situation. What determines the impact of social norms on behavior? Um, according to the researchers, that is salience, the extent to which we are focused on that social norm. And it also explains salience. If a descriptive and injunctive norm are in conflict in a situation, which of the two you are most likely to follow? Mm -hmm.